a new accounting framework for insurers and reinsurance that report under international financial reporting standards came into force on January the 1st, 2023. Known as IFRS 17, it impacts large parts of insurers and reinsurers' external financial reporting and metrics. For AM Best TV, I'm Richard Banks. And I'm joined today by Tony Silverman, Director Credit Rating Criteria Research and Analytics, who's the author of a new report looking at some of the early responses to IFRS 17. Can we start with some of your observations from the first quarter IFRS 17 disclosures? I'd say that the amount of disclosure varied uh, uh, quite considerably across territories. It, uh, uh, for the large European and UK insurers, uh, their trading statements and technically, uh, well, they are trading statements rather than full reporting. So there was more limited. There's no none of the roll forward tables, which will take up a lot of space and be quite a feature of full reporting when it gets uh, when it gets into swing. So it's a bit of a, if you like, the phony war stage for those. Uh, on the other hand, in Canada and the UAE, there was full reporting. That's uh, worth commenting on. Uh, in principle, those could be used uh, for our purposes, although I'll come on to something else in a moment. And then at the other extreme, there are certain territories and emerging markets where companies are supposed to be reporting under IFS 17, and they didn't for the Q1 reporting. Maybe they will later on. Uh, but even in the full, uh, full reporting, there, there's uh, uh, data which we think will normally be part of that in, uh, over time as this gets into full swing, but which is, uh, you know, wasn't there now. Uh, and I think there's uh, quite a few items in that category. Tell us a bit more about data that wasn't in the Q1s, and do you expect that it will be in subsequent reporting? Well, absolutely. There are a few things that are, are worth commenting on. Uh, IFS 17 wraps up uh, like agents' balances, insurers, insurance debtors and creditors are just future cash flows, and whereas those insurance debtors and creditors would have been reported before they're wrapped up in insurance contract liabilities under IFS 17, we will ask uh, clients for that, uh, for those numbers. And I think that in the fullness of time, they will become uh, normal, uh, normally included in reporting. Uh, another uh, item which is sort of in that category is uh, if P&C business is reported under the GMM, it's not actually a required disclosure that the risk adjustment is, uh, that the, the, the part of the risk adjustment that applies to incurred claims, outstanding claims as they were, the part of the risk adjustment that applies to it's not a required disclosure that is recorded that, that is reported separately. The, the risk adjustment that's required disclosure covers both uh, um, remaining coverage and incurred claims. And I think that uh, if for PNC business reported under the GMM, and I think for that category of business, uh, the incurred claims risk adjustment will be normal reporting in good time. Uh, there are several other things in that category, um, uh, but I, I, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Insurers have also started to state some KPIs. Were there any surprises? And how do you see industry KPIs developing from here under IFRS 17? Yeah, well, that's, uh, we can write a book on that. It's a great question. Uh, the one or two things that I would... Um, uh, uh, sort of pull out at this stage. Uh, we actually wrote something a year ago saying that P and C combined ratios can be calculated in different ways under IFS 17. Uh, and we expected the uh, so-called net-net method to uh, uh, be the usual first stop, though we saw advantages to what's called the net gross method. These are different ways of calculating the combined ratio. <coughs> We have been, I, thought, I would say, slightly surprised at the uh, relatively small but noticeable number of big insurers that are using the net gross method. Uh, but it's hard, very hard to say uh, which of these two will fall out as uh, become dominant in the future, if any of them do. It may be that different categories of insurers just use slightly different calculations. We, we, we can look at both and, and compare them uh, sensibly. Uh, the other thing which emerged was the uh, use of uh, 
in, in some occasions, and I think this will be general, uh, an operating profit number appears as now, which gets rid of uh, um, uh, uh, volatility in the investment return. Uh, that's the same as now and other uh, one-off uh, expenses. There's the, um, uh, the other thing I would mention, is, as I say, we could uh, go on for a while on this one. But the other thing I would mention is that IFS 17, for the first time, gives us these uh, audited new business profits in the form of uh, the CSM on, uh, on new business. Uh, well, we've seen the beginnings of, company, of insurers applying this to uh, uh, non-insurance, business not classified as insurance under IFS 17, but which they would like to uh, report in this way. You know, wealth management activities, uh, things close to investment management, but where the assets are sticky, that sort of thing. Uh, and the, so I think these uh, non-GAAP measures as uh, they may be referred to. Uh, you know, there's going to be quite a few of them around. And it's going to take two or three years for this to settle down. And again, as now, uh, it's, it, it's okay for different companies, different insurers to use slightly different KPIs uh, to uh, try and communicate their business to the external uh, financial markets. Tony, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. To learn more about AMBest's views on IFRS 17, visit ambest.com. For AMBest TV, I'm Richard Banks.